Well, let me start, Josh. I like your boots. Thank you. But I, I would think uh, in the Senate where you're at, you would need hip waders. <laughs> well, I, I do most days. Uh, let me start kind of on a personal note um, about how you two met. So, Aaron, I'm going to start with you. Sure. So we met in law school, um, but did not know one another well. Um, Josh likes to tell the story that it's because he was a year behind me. And then I always have to point out, but I am not older. <laughs> so, um, but we ended up clerking uh, for the same judge uh, the same year and actually shared an office. And we were so busy, we didn't have time um, to, to uh, do much but work, um, but got to know one another really well. Um, that was wonderful. What she means to say is the only reason that uh, she had finally went out on a date with me is because I wore her down. We we're in the same <laughs> office. She couldn't escape, you know, so months and months. Finally, she was like, all right, fine, fine. We can go out. So you, 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 Josh, you were doing a little bit more than studying case law. <laughs> exactly right. That's exactly right, Tony. I, I was studying, but, uh, you know, it was the gal right across the desk from me. <laughs> so... What, uh, give, me, give us the rest of the story, how that unfold. Well, we clerked, we clerked for uh, the Chief Justice, and, uh, you know, we, we'd like to say when we told him, the Chief Justice Roberts, when we told him that uh, we were going to get married, you know, he said, oh, that's great, and, and he, he likes to take credit for our marriage, and, and we'd like to say to him that we're the most conservative thing he's ever done. You know, this is one of those points that I'll just avoid commentary. Um, so so when, when that began, when, when you guys got married, did you ever envision that you were going to be a, a and, and I use this not in a, I use this very cautiously, but really a DC power couple. I mean, the Lord has positioned you both in very significant roles. And I know you walk in those humbly, but did you ever envision that? I don't think so, not for my part, um, no. Well, and Aaron, I remember when, when I met Aaron and, and we were talking about uh, you know, life and, and what we felt the Lord had called us to and the passions that we had and dreams to the future. And I remember something Aaron said to me really early on. She said, well, one thing, I hate politics. <laughs> I go, so I don't ever want to do that. <laughs> so here we are, you know, here, here we are. Life, the Lord has a funny way of, you know, and I remember when we were thinking about running for this job for the Senate which was not something we'd planned to do. And uh, Aaron came to me and you know, we both had, we took some time, Tony, to, to pray about it, fast about it, pray with other folks. And we did that together, of course, but then we also, we did it separately. And I remember Aaron came to me at one point, and she said, I've been praying about this, she said, and I just, I just feel terrible about it. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, oh, I just hate this, but I think we're supposed to do it. <laughs> and and I are. knew he would win, which made it work. <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, you really, as the Attorney General of Missouri, you took on a number of religious liberty issues. Yeah. You also went after social media yeah. and the data that they were collecting. So many of the issues that you are dealing with here, you, you dealt with in Missouri. In fact, Missouri, uh, your successor, following in uh, with actually two successors from you, now who, your other uh, successors, Senator Schmidt, is in the Senate with you. Uh, started going after the big tech, and in fact, Missouri and Louisiana won a major case at the Fifth Circuit just recently. Big time, huge case, and you know, we were the first, when I was Attorney General, we were the first state in the country to go after Google, to sue them, then to go after Facebook, and uh, that has now continued, and, and uh, my, as you said, my successor, the current, current Attorney General, has taken this all the way to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, his own cases, to be clear, and he's done a phenomenal job. And what we've learned is that big government, the Biden administration, has used those tech companies, they've been happy to go along, by the way, but they, they have used them as a mouthpiece of their liberal agenda, such that we now know those tech companies have censored parents, they have censored religious believers, they have censored people of faith. They said for years we were crazy. You know, we'd say that and the media would say, oh, that's not true, that's a conspiracy theory. Now we've got it in black and white, they censored us, it is a First Amendment violation, they violated the Constitution, and we have got to make sure it never happens yeah. again. And all of that because we stood up.
Yeah, and we just we, we see another pattern emerge in that with the the White House sending out a letter to the uh, legacy media telling them not to pay attention to the uh, Republican inquiry of impeachment. Of course, we have the new variant of COVID out, the election variant uh, that uh, that is out. Uh, I mean, it, it's like we're seeing a repeat. Yeah. yeah, no, that's exactly right. I think what we find is this administration. And the radical left has an incredible thirst for power, Tony. And, and I would just say, I, I don't know how you feel, but I think we are facing the most serious threat to our country in any of our lifetimes. And I mean, maybe, maybe in the last century or more, I mean, the radical cultural Marxism, the new Marxism that is driving this administration and is driving the left, it is a thirst for power. And you're seeing it, Tony. I mean, if you disagree with them, they will come after you. They will try to shut you down. Heck, they would throw us all in jail if they could. They absolutely would. And it's, a, it's an extremism of a kind we've never seen, I think, in this country before. And that is why, above all, it is a time for all conservatives, but especially for believers. It is a time for us to stand up and defend the principles of this country. Amen. Not, not only have they they weaponize government uh, against us, but they've got their stormtroopers out there, Antifa. Yes. And in fact, Aaron, you experienced this a few years back when Antifa, you were home alone with your newborn daughter here in D.C., and they, they came to your house. And, and, and I mean, it was a threatening mob. Most people don't see that. Of course, the media rarely reports that. I mean, we had a shooting at our place 12 years ago, and the media kind of no big deal. How did that impact your view of moving forward in this space? So I think two things. Um, first, I was incredibly thankful Josh had taken the boys to Missouri. So I was incredibly thankful they were not there. Um, and, and so weren't frightened by uh, the mob outside the door. Um, so, so definitely God's provision in that. Um, but I think it also just confirms, um, you know, it, it is often when you're doing the work of the Lord, um, that you face opposition. And so, so I think that is part of that um, and that we have an obligation to stand firm in that calling um, even when you face situations like that. Did you maybe have second thoughts about maybe I go back home to Missouri where it's a little safer? <laughs> I, I definitely would like to go back home to Missouri, but, but not for that reason. <laughs> um, it, it honestly made me a little angry just to think that, you know, people would plan to come at night when families are... It, you know, supposed to be at home in the safety of their, their home with their families enjoying dinner and, and to disrupt that purposefully, right. um, I think is, is uncalled for. Josh, we're at a new level. Uh, it's not just, I mean, I remember when I was in elected office back in Louisiana, I would disagree with Democrats and we go to lunch. Uh, they want to eat you for lunch now. I mean, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's not the same. There, there is no camaraderie. There's no almost, it's like we used to work for one picture. We might have a different a strategy of doing it, but th there's a spiritual side of what is happening right now. When we look at these debates over whether a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl, and I mean, it's just, it's, we're at a different time. And, and I think that what's really at stake here is the spiritual foundation of the country. You know, I mean, there's one thing that I will agree with Joe Biden on. When he says that we are really in a struggle for the soul of America, He's right about that. Yes. He's right about that. It, it is our nation's soul that is at stake here. And what you see is the radical left that now controls the Democrat Party, they want to change this nation's soul. That's why they want to rewrite our history. They want to say we were founded in 1619, not 1776. They want to say we were founded on oppression. And Tony, let's just be, let's be honest. Let's tell the truth here. Their real target in all of that is our Christian faith yes. and our Christian heritage. They want to erase it. They want to... Uh, pretend that it is the source of all evil and oppression. And the truth is, America is the greatest country in the history of the world because we are founded on biblical principles. That's the reason. And we should be bold in saying it. Aaron, one of the issues that is really at the tip of the spear when we talk about the spiritual battle in this country and, and, and light and darkness, good and evil, is the issue of abortion. And you were very much involved in the case that came out of Mississippi. And frankly, 
many of us did not think we would ever see that day. We were working toward it and thought it might come someday in the future. What, what was it like to be a part of that case that put Roe v. Wade in the dustbin of history? It, it was amazing, Tony. And, and I have to, to tell you that one of the most amazing things about it is I joined Alliance Defending Freedom not long after we'd had our third child, our daughter, Abigail. And so I was supposed to be working just a quarter time. Uh, we've got three kids at home, and, and so I was supposed to be working a quarter time. And, and my boss says, hey, you know, they granted cert in this Mississippi case. We're going to go down and see if we can help. Um, can you come? And I, I said, sure, I would love to, um, but, but I've got this baby girl. And she said, just bring her. Um, so, so Abigail and I flew down to Mississippi with the team. Um, and, you know, a typical story, you know, a babysitter hadn't arrived yet, so she's screaming bloody murder uh, in this meeting. I uh, was slightly embarrassed. I'm new to ADF. Um, but it was also just such a beautiful picture of what it was we were fighting for. Um, I am so biased, but Abigail's beautiful, this curly, redheaded girl. But the truth is she's not any more precious, any more loved by God than any other child, each one of them deserving of life. And so, so it was just a huge privilege to get to help with Dobbs, but even more so um, having a young daughter at the time. Were you surprised by the outcome? So, so I actually wasn't. Um, I, I was one of the, the ones that thought we'd never get a better court. We had to go for it. Um, and I think the day when people realized that Roe might actually be on the chopping block was December 1st, 2021, when the Supreme Court heard oral argument. And during that oral argument, we heard Justice Kavanaugh say things like, you know, the Constitution's silent on abortion. Why should the court make up this rule that we can kill children? Uh, we had heard Justice Amy Bar Coney Barrett being really, uh, you know, positive, like there are not burdens on women. There are these other options uh, that are available. And so I think at that argument, we could, could hope um, that what we've been praying for for so many generations might actually happen. So Josh, how do we get that court? Well. We got that court really because of President Donald Trump. I mean, that's the truth. So when you see him later tonight, thank him for me, will you? I mean, and, and also because, listen, the thing that President Trump did that uh, Tony, I think, was so courageous and that, frankly, no other Republican presidential candidate, really since Reagan, you know, Reagan was very clear on this when he first ran for president in 1980, that he was pro-life and he was gonna appoint pro-life judges. He said that, and the, Donald Trump said that in 2016. He said, I'm gonna put pro-life judges on the bench, on the Supreme Court. And I remember when I had just come to the Senate, and it was before there was the Amy Coney Barrett vacancy, uh, before uh, Justice Ginsburg had, had died. And uh, I just said, you know what? I wanna make this really clear. So I went to the floor of the Senate, and I just said, I wanna be clear. I'm not gonna vote as a United States Senator for any Supreme Court justice, any nominee to the yeah. court, who is not clear that Roe versus Wade is wrongly decided. I don't want any nudge, nudge, wink, wink. They gotta say it. I wanna know that they understand because it is, it's such a landmark issue. If you think Roe is okay, or if you think that it's just, uh, you know, ho hum, then you don't understand the role of the court in America. You don't understand the Constitution. And I think, frankly, you don't understand what life is about. And so. President Trump, to his great credit, nominated Amy Coney Barrett, who had been openly critical of Roe, and the left had a meltdown, and we confirmed her anyway, and uh, now Roe is gone. Yeah. I, re I remember you making that speech from the floor. In fact, I, I played it on my program. I think I may have had you on the program talking about it, but I think that's the clarity that we need, and for years, you know, we, we kind of did this wink and a nod. We had leaders that would kind of stand in the shadows. We need to stand in the light and make very clear what we're for. And, and I will go one step further in terms of Donald Trump making those three appointments to the court. He did it because of you. Because you put him in office, you stood with him, and you believed what he said, and he did what he said he was gonna do. That is refreshing. You recently wrote a book. I think it's outstanding. You've been talking about this for some time. It's actually something we began working on at the Family Research Council a number of years ago with our Stand Courageous Men's Conferences. But if we could solve one issue and one issue alone in this nation that could turn around so much, it would be dealing with the issue of masculinity, manhood, and fatherhood. Absolutely. I mean, if you just 
Look at the statistics. You want to solve the problem of kids in poverty in America, put a father back in the home. You want to deal with the epidemic, the epidemic of crime and violence in this country. And by the way, has it ever been more obvious that the liberal soft on crime policies don't work, that they destroy whole communities? But you want to deal with that with children, with the, the youth epidemic of violence? Put a father in the home. Yeah. And what the liberals have said, Tony, for years, and you've been fighting this battle, they said that fathers don't matter. They've said the two-parent family is outmoded and outdated and it doesn't matter. Nothing could be further from the truth. And we need to call a generation of men. We need to tell them, you want your life to matter, you want to have a legacy, you want to have significance, get married, have children, invest your life in something more than you, and you'll matter. And you'll change your life, and you'll change this country. And we need to call men to that. I mean, it's, it's really basic. That's what our nation was built upon, laying a foundation for the next generation. And today, even in our budgeting, when we have $32 trillion in debt, we're not laying a foundation for the next generation. We're actually consuming what the next generation should have. And so it, it all starts back in the home. So Aaron, I want, I want to ask you this question because we're at a, a, we, we've discussed this, it's been brought up. We're at a very pivotal time in our nation. It's not a time to retreat. It's a time to advance, to engage, and we see this across the country. We've trained over 3,500 individuals for school board races, and we see that mothers, fathers running for school board. You've been involved, as we just talked about, some very significant cases. You're raising young children. Give mothers, young women, kind of as some encouragement of how we can balance all of those things. So, so balance is, is always a, a juggling act, as Joshua knows. Um, but, but I think it's just with the Lord's grace. Um, and I think one thing that can trip moms up um, is just being afraid. Um, I, I realized last night, actually, as I was praying for my kids, we, we take turns putting them to bed. Joshua reads them a story um, and then prays with them and puts them to bed. And then, then I go in and sing a song that I've sung to them, Jesus Loves Me. So, so they're 10 and 8, but they still love that song, which is wonderful. Uh, so go in and sing to them and pray for them, and, and um, they go to bed. Um, and I realized as I was praying for them, I say the same thing every night, and I pray for the Lord to protect them from the top of their head to the bottom of their toes. And if you know our children, you know this prayer is very necessary. <laughs> it's very important. Um, but, but it struck me last night that that's not the most important thing that I can be praying for. Uh, the most important thing that I can be praying for them is for them to, to grow up in the strength and courage to fulfill the call that God has on their lives and to really place themselves as, as humble servants to, to walk out and, and to work out that call and, and to do what it is that he's called them to, um, even in the face of opposition. And so, so I'm gonna try to pray for that, uh, even though that, that scares me as a mom, because I know that call uh, can come with uh, challenges as well. But I was talking with Josh about this, listened to a, a sermon last night um, from Elijah, from uh, second, or Elisha, I should say, Second Kings 4. And the sermon was about the woman who, who has no children, uh, that God miraculously gives her a child. Uh, the child dies suddenly, so she's going to Elisha for help. And as she's going, she tells her husband, it will be all right. And I love that faith and confidence in, in the midst of raising children in what can seem like a scary culture. We know it will be all right because God is on his throne. Oh, that's good. That's so good. I'm going to give you a similar question, Josh. As Aaron talked about the hostility that we see, and it's very real. You made reference to it. And, and not everyone's called to be a United States senator, uh, fortunately. Um, <laughs> Some who were there probably weren't called, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them need to be called home. But uh, the, the reality is, uh, we were talking about this earlier in the, uh, t this morning about Nehemiah and rebuilding the wall where Nehemiah's strategy was that each built in front of their own home. So we're all called to different places, but we live in a time of great intimidation. People are losing their jobs. Uh, people are being marginalized, they're being attacked. Not, nothing like what we see when I was on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, the, the, the deaths and persecutions that are happening abroad. Although I would say it's connected to our own hostility here toward religion at home. What would you say? To, to, to men 
about the times in which we live and how to face those challenging times? Well, I, I, w I would just say this, that, you know, it's a, it is a challenging time that we live in, but it is also a tremendous blessing. I mean, you think about this, whatever else you say to your kids and your grandkids now and for years to come, what you will not say to them is, ah, oh, we lived in a time that was, it was very boring. Nothing of import was going on. It was all very calm, right? <laughs> That's not today. That's not this America. What you're going to say is, what we say to our kids, and what the truth is, is that we live in a time of enormous consequence. But that means we have the privilege, Tony, to act and stand and be bold in a time of enormous consequence. So, I just think that, you know, we can be discouraged and say that uh, this is tough, this is a tough time. Sure, but it's also the Lord has called us to this time. He's placed us in this time. He's given us a voice in this time, and he's given us the opportunity by being bold, by taking a stand, by praying and, and fighting with the weapons of faith and putting on the full armor of God. He's given us the opportunity to change the direction of this nation. And I don't know about you, but I want to be able to say to our kids in years to come, and my grandkids, Lord willing, one day, that in this time of trial, that we did everything we could, that we took a stand for the Lord, that we did what he called us to do, that we fought the good fight, that we ran the good race to the best of our ability, and we left the rest to him. And I just think for men, what higher calling could there be in any walk of life? So I just say, let's embrace it. Rather than being afraid or intimidated or, or for heaven's sake, feel sorry for ourselves, let's embrace it. This is a time of consequence. The Lord yes. has given us great opportunity. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Yes. And we're here for it. Absolutely. And as Paul wrote in Philippians, in all things, give thanks. And, and, and in these times of great anxiety and difficulty, give thanks. When we give thanks and thanking God and embracing the opportunities we have, we see the power of God begin to work. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to ask you just to kind of share with how can we be praying for, for you uh, as a couple and as a family, but also just how can, from your vantage points, how do we need to be praying for our nation? I'll go first while Aaron takes a drink. <laughs> I think, um, you know, I think for the nation, well, I would just, I would just say this. I, I, I think that what we as, as believers, and certainly this is true for me personally, I, I think what we need as believers is we need a baptism of courage. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we need to, the left wants to intimidate us. The left wants to silence us. You know, you talked about what the, this administration's doing. You know, they're sending SWAT teams to the homes of pro-life demonstrators. You know, that's an incredible violation of our Constitution, by the way. I mean, it's just sickening. But why are they doing it? Because they want to intimidate us. Because they want us to be silent. Why are they putting informants into churches? The FBI is putting informants into churches in this nation, in this day and age. Can you believe this? Why are they doing it? Because they want to intimidate us. They want us to be afraid. And that's the, that's the, the whole agenda of the enemy is always to want us to be afraid. So I think, Tony, for me, for Aaron, but I think for the nation, let's pray for a baptism of courage for believers in this country to stand up and to trust the Lord and to say that we'll, we'll, we'll speak for him no matter what it costs us. And if we're, you know, we're denounced and disliked and, and uh, uh, we're cast out by the, uh, the elites, you know, so be it. I mean, what a privilege to get to stand for the Lord in this time. Sounds biblical. We should do it. And for my part, I, I would echo that. Um, I, I love that. And then I'm also reminded, um, I had the chance long ago to work for um, the, the Bush administration and the Department of Justice. And he gave a speech at the end of the year just sort of thanking uh, folks for serving. Um, and someone asked him, you know, what was the, the most surprising thing um, of his tenure? And he pulled a card from his pocket. Um, and on it was a prayer um, that someone had sent him, someone he didn't know. And he said, the most surprising thing has been the power of people praying for me that I've never met. Um, so, so we covet those prayers. Uh, we thank you for them, and, and we're so grateful. Can I pray for you? Can we pray for you? Will you join me in praying for Josh and Aaron? Father, we thank you for our time together, and I thank you for Josh and Aaron and for their family. And we do pray for a covering of protection upon them and a, a fresh anointing of boldness and of courage 
And Lord, I pray that we would all experience in the body of Christ, just as the disciples prayed after being threatened by the religious crowd, they went and they prayed for boldness to speak the word of God. Lord, may Josh continue to be given opportunity and platform, and may Aaron be able to use her gifts and talents, Lord, to advance truth and righteousness in this day. And Lord, may they continue to be an example to others. Strengthen them, encourage them, protect them. Lord, we bless them in your name, in Jesus' name.